an upper body workout with the man, the myth, the legend, super expert, Dr. Eric Helms, PhD, professor, natural pro bodybuilder. I'm not a professor. But you profess. I am a senior research fellow at the Auckland University of Technology, Sports Performance Research Institute, New Zealand. And that's even more impressive. Three, two, one, impress. So what we got here, I am doing a single arm cable lap pull down. I'm sitting slightly sideways in the seat. This allows me to use as much stretch in the lat as I can get. A typical lat pull down, you're doing bilateral, which is fine, but the lats, just based upon their attachment and how they work, you can get a little more stretch by reaching up and across. Then I'm just gonna be simply pulling down to the same position where you'd finish a normal lat pull down, keeping my abs tight, not overarching my lower back, which takes some of your ability to leverage and keep the spine stable so you can pull with the lats. I have a over thumb grip, so I can really think about pulling from the elbow rather than using my arm as much and hopefully getting a little less bicep and getting a little more focus on my back. And then once we get towards the end of the set, we're going to let the movement decay until I'm doing just lengthened partials until I can barely get anything out of it. Back work generally is a lot harder in the shortened position. It's much harder to lock out a cable row or a lat pull down than it is in the initial phase. So to make sure that we get the most out of it, we're gonna be doing actually that kind of past failure training. You're probably not getting very sore in your lats on a regular basis. If you try this, you might find that you are, indicating that you actually push that muscle close to fatigue. So we just did lengthen partials to finish off with the back. And the main reason for that is like I said, when you're doing back work, it is harder in the shortened position. So you're not really getting the best bang for your buck in terms of efficiency for most back work because when the muscle is getting shorter, it's getting harder. Marines tell you, hey, make sure you get your chin over the bar and that's great, it is challenging. If you wanna get better at the movement, go for it. But unfortunately, pull downs, rows, they're quite easy in that lengthened position. So that's why we did some of those extended set techniques to try to get more milk out of that lengthened position. In pressing, however, you don't really need to do that. The hardest portion of a press is right out of the bottom. So if you're going close to failure, you're probably gonna be failing in the lengthened position anyway. So we're just gonna do traditional training for our press. I think you wanna find the right angle for you where you are feeling this primarily in your pecs, maybe a little more in your upper pec region. You can use a low incline or you can use a high incline. Some of this is gonna depend upon kind of your rib cage structure, the sternal angle, and then just the comfortability you have in the shoulders and the range of motion you wanna use. I'm currently using about a 45 degree and you wanna come down at a slight angle so you're not flaring too much here and you're just kind of in line with the natural pull of your pecs, and you're gonna come all the way until you're feeling the dumbbells touch. You might have to sacrifice load a little bit, that's totally fine. Plant the feet, nice and stable. Big deep breath. I'm just gonna be pressing and then controlling down. Fuck yeah. Also count your first rep on these when they're heavy because you're doing the work to get it up there. You earned it. You guys will notice on that last rep of incline dumbbell press, as soon as Eric got up that last rep, he didn't just abandon ship. He rode that eccentric down with full control. Because if you think about it, that last rep, basically zero reps in reserve, the only way that you're controlling that eccentric is to recruit a huge fraction, maybe all of your faster twitch motor units which are more likely to grow. So that one eccentric af after the set has essentially gone almost a failure, as far as that half rep, the amount of growth you're stimulating is probably competitive, maybe a little better than every other part of every other rep of that exercise. Why abandon the worst part of the rep? If, ah uh, man, I make a bunch of politically incorrect analogies about. The RP Hypertrophy app comes with dozens of pre-made programs from two days of training per week, all the way up to six days of training with specialized programs included for shoulders, arms, 
chest, back, legs, abs, and glutes, each one with male and female options. You get them all and can use them as often as you like, even building off of them to make your own customized versions for only about a dollar a day. Click on the link in the description of this video to get started. So next we're gonna do the dumbbell pullover. This is a movement that got a lot of love historically in bodybuilding, but has fallen out of favor. It's an interesting movement because some people will tell you it's for the chest, other people will tell you it's for the lats, and the answer is, it's a bit for both. Bullshit! Eric forgot the most important part of one of the pullover's functions is to expand your rib cage. You're gonna have the small bird rib cage. People are gonna miss you. They're gonna see you on the street. You walk by, do the cruise that. But if you have a huge rib cage, your bones grow somehow, but the, uh, as you then discover the anatomical mechanisms, and then you're gonna be like, and then they're gonna be like, oh my God, and that's it. Yeah, you learned something. They bet you didn't have that in New Zealand with all the porcupines they have there. The little guys, they always want to keep it right here, but they have to expand, show them, you know, show them, get it out. And that's what you need to do a lap pullover for is to get larger. That's right. Yeah. This isn't one of your typical back exercises, which is like back and biceps. It's actually pec, lats, terrace major, and a little bit of triceps. So it's actually a great one to pair with an incline because I find most people don't have the range of motion if they do it properly to be fully flat. So what I'll do is I'll bring this down to just the lowest incline setting right here. And I actually like to keep my feet a little bit elevated when I do this so I can keep my core tight so I'm not arching my lower back and losing some of the range of motion at the shoulder. So tight abs, and you just wanna let yourself relax into the stretch at the bottom on each rep without losing that core tightness. Think of keeping your lumbar touching the incline bench and you're gonna feel a nice pump and stretch in the pec at the very bottom, as well as the triceps, and a bit into the lats, terrace major area. And if you push this close to failure, you should feel all of that light up quite nicely. And when you get stuck, if it's very hard right here, just bend your elbows in, shorten the lever arm to spot yourself. This is one way you feel like if you go to failure, your arms are just gonna snap behind you. You just gotta remember you can shorten that lever arm just by bending your elbows and it gets way easy and you can actually fail on these pretty comfortably. All right, so these three movements really go well together because when you're in a busy gym, you may not, ha not have time to do these on separate pieces of equipment and they're great for being antagonist paired sets. You can just do them in a circuit, right? So what we got here is an incline curl. Now, incline curls are pretty interesting. We now have three studies comparing preacher curls to incline curls, showing slightly different regional hypertrophy differences, or what I would probably describe as muscle compartment specific differences. The biceps or the elbow flexor complex, you do have your biceps, which is actually biarticular, crosses the shoulder, crosses the elbow. So the more shoulder extension you're in, the more stretch you get on the biceps. However, you also have the brachialis, which sits underneath the biceps. It's more distal to the shoulder, and it crosses only the elbow joint. So it doesn't matter where your shoulder is. When your arm with the free weight is parallel to the ground, that's when the lever arm is longest. Meaning when you're doing a traditional bicep curl, right here, that's when the load is gonna feel heaviest and when the tension is gonna be highest on the elbow flexors. When you're in a preacher curl position, same point. When the load is furthest from your elbow and the tension is highest on the muscle, but because the brachialis doesn't cross the shoulder, it doesn't matter that you're in shoulder flexion. So these studies have all shown greater growth more distally in the brachialis region from doing preacher curls and greater growth in the biceps in doing an incline curl. So in this workout, we're gonna be doing some incline curls. Just be aware that you might wanna also include some other variations like a preacher curl or a cable curl where the tension is a little more consistent to get a better stimulus overall in all the elbow flexors. So stay back. Abs tight, bring your shoulders back to the degree you're comfortable. Full extension at the, at the bottom. Let your elbows lock out unless it hurts or it's uncomfortable. And you're just curling up to that point right there. There you go. <sighs> Fuck yeah. <sighs> Oh, 
pulls back. Beautiful. <sighs> Come on. <sighs> momentary muscular failure. Very momentary. Mm. Very muscular. Ah. Now you'll notice I did direct bicep work, but I didn't do any direct tricep work. At least that's what you think. The pullover, because it actually is isolated shoulder extension, does specifically train the long head. And the long head gets almost no activity when you're doing pressing exercises because it's biarticular, meaning that it is not actually going to be very active when I'm doing that incline press. The reason being is that I'm also moving through shoulder flexion. So if the tricep, the long head specifically, was active during shoulder flexion, it would be opposing shoulder flexion since it's a shoulder extensor. So the incline press is getting two heads of my tricep, but not the long head, and the pullover is getting the long head. So I'm effectively getting a pretty good tricep stimulus between the incline press and the pullover, and then I'm isolating the bicep with that incline curl. And between all these movements, we're getting a pretty good overall upper body stimulus. You might also be thinking, oh man, you're doing a lot more lat work than you are pressing work. You've got the pull down and you got the pullover. But remember, in that deep position in the pullover, when I'm in sh full shoulder flexion, the pec is actually getting some engagement as well. So this is a pretty time efficient way of getting some pretty targeted hypertrophy stimulus for the entire body. Last exercise we're gonna be doing in this workout is for the middle deltoid. And we're gonna be doing a cable lateral raise. So recent research came out by Larson and colleagues comparing a dumbbell lateral raise to a cable lateral raise, showing that there was no significant difference between groups in terms of the regional hypertrophy or hypertrophy of the deltoid. And the deltoid is rarely actually assessed in exercise science. So this doesn't matter at all, just do dumbbell lateral raises. No, that's actually not the way we interpret research. We have to think about the concept and then integrate it, and we need far more than one study to be confident in the outcomes in terms of their broad application. So, the good news is dumbbell lateral raises, cable lateral raises, they're probably just as effective as one another broadly, but you could get a slight better benefit by being in a more stretched position if we extrapolate from research on other muscle groups. So what we're gonna be doing is a behind the back cable lateral raise. So what I'm gonna be doing, I'll show you from the front. Scott, are you filming my butt? Did you ask for permission? I don't think so. Yeah, okay, well that's probably something to work on in the future, but that's okay. So what we're gonna be doing is reaching behind our back to the point where you have the shoulder mobility. Now, the position of how you set up the cable might matter a little bit, okay? Anytime you're doing a cable movement, think of the angle pull of the cable like the line of gravity. So if this was down here, like most people traditionally do cable lateral raises, the line of gravity is pulling up at an angle. So that means at that point where I have a 90 degree, that's where the tension is gonna be highest or the leverage will be highest the distance from the fulcrum, right? And if I wanna have this when my delt is in a longer position, however, if I wanna have more load in the more lengthened position, lining it up so that I'm immediately at roughly a 90 degree angle is where you wanna be at. So it'll be challenging, less challenging. Again, kind of a natural length and partial, if you will. Now, if you need to save time, not the best movement in the world, single arm, unilateral stuff, go ahead and grab those dumbbells. This isn't gonna make a major difference, but if you're looking to optimize things, I would hedge my bets towards doing the cable lateral raises because you can get a greater stretch and you can load the initial portion of the range of motion. When I do middle deltoid work, I pretty much go to failure all the time. I almost never get soreness, even when I'm doing past failure, length and position, length and bias work like that. They seem to respond pretty well to high volumes, high frequencies, and going past failure. So when you're doing something like this, like a drop set, make sure because you're making these large absolute drops that you use something like an intermediary weight because you're typically not going to be able to do more than 20, 30 pounds on your initial set. And if you drop from 30 to 20, that's two thirds of the load. Traditionally on drop sets, what is a good drop is like a 20% in load. So when you have to make these larger jumps, be aware that you will almost start increasing reps when what you really want is to see the reps stay roughly the same or slightly decrease. <sighs> <sighs> Ooh. 
Oh, yeah, so I don't worry about the reps too much. I just take each one of the sets to the point where I'm barely getting any, any range of motion. Drop sets, when you look at them, how they compare to straight sets, they're less efficient because obviously, if you're dropping the load and getting fewer reps, you're producing less force, but you can make up for that because of the time saving. You can get through one top set and three drops in the time it just takes to do one and a half straight sets. All right, folks. I had a lot of great fun learning from Eric as always in this workout. This is one of my esteemed colleagues. And really, um, I look up to you, Eric, for teaching me stuff that I wouldn't otherwise know because I don't read too good. <laughs> but um, what did you think? How was your workout today? Do you have any tips for the folks? Just uh, kind of maybe a few little things that really, really will help? No, I, it was a, it's a huge pleasure, huge honor to always be able to have the opportunity to teach all the people on the RP channel. Um, yeah, I think the main things are the pullover is a pretty underutilized movement. Very. There's few exercises where you get to train your triceps, chest, and back. Uh, and you can use that to your advantage to make some time efficient techniques be utilized in the gym. Um, one of the things when I travel or when I go to a really crowded gym, um, I like to be time efficient. I don't have much time. So if I can just grab a bench and a couple of dumbbells, you can get a lot of stuff done really efficiently. Like if I wanted to do different rep ranges on say some of those movements, I could have done, you know, a different dumbbell in each hand to do the pullovers. And I could have done higher reps on my incline presses and then still been able to do curls and just grab two pairs of dumbbells, an incline bench, and half of my workout can be done just in a little corner, Huge. even at prime time. Huge. And a good workout compared to a shitty workout is much better than an optimal workout compared to no workout at all. A hundred percent. And I think uh, a lot of the times people, they will over-evaluate the marginal benefits you get from things like, say, prime equipment or a slightly better resistance profile. Uh, and you can use some of these techniques where you end up reaching failure in that lengthened position, even on a movement that is generally maybe not that great. Uh, and I think you can get, if not all of that made back up, uh, the vast majority of it. Yep, 100%. Eric, huge pleasure having you. Where can people find you? You can find me at 3dmusclejourney.com if you're interested in seeing the application of research into coaching. Uh, I am accompanied there by a great, you know, suite of coaches who are the ones who handle me when I actually prep and I am competing later this year. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And then if you're interested in just learning more about this practical stuff, check out the 3DMJ Vault, which is where we have all of our courses on very practical topics for competitive bodybuilding and non-competitive bodybuilding. Well, there you go. Folks, see you next time.